Hey guys, Cliff Dennis here with Weld.com, and guess what? Man, I got a crack. I got a pretty bad one. Straight through, clean break. It's been broken for a long time, and uh, I've got to fix it. So guess what I'm doing today? I'm calling out farmers. I'm calling out those farmer repairs, because this is a piece of ag equipment and we're going to talk about agricultural repair and how to do it right because I know you. I'm one of you. I've been that quick fix farmer guy. Stop it. Let's do it right. Farmers, why am I picking on you guys? Why am I doing a video on ag repair? Well, I've been there before. I've done what I've had to do in the moment, that quick fix to get me by and get me back up and rolling. And to be honest with you, most of the time, most of those quick fixes, they just break again anyways. And I think you need to, to really consider the correct way how to do it the correct way and doing it correct the first time. It's going to save you time. It's going to save you money in the long haul. It might take a little bit more energy and resource up front, but guess what? I think you want to be known as the guy. I think you want to be employed as the guy. You want to be respected as the guy who can fix something and fix it the right time the first time so you're not constantly doubling back in a month, in a day, in a week, and you're fixing it over and over again. That's where time is going to hit you. That's, that's where you're going to get behind is all that rework. Let's really try and pay attention to some of the right things that we can do initially to make us better at it. And that's going to save us time and money. What is this? This is actually a tractor tub. What's a tub? Well, this is the front end frame. This is a piece of cast steel. And this piece of cast steel would support the engine, the front radiator, front axle gets bolted underneath here, get back into our clutch assembly, and this whole thing bolts to the rear transmission and differential. This is all stripped down bare. It's all stripped down bare because I've got to address these issues. I've got this through crack that's been there a long time. I've got this previous repair that I'm going to address as long as I'm here. And we're actually missing some plate steel out of here that I got to replace so that front axle mount bracket can go back on and be secure while it's on. I play with a lot of old iron guys. F series international farm all tractors, pre-39 stuff. This is right in that time frame. This is actually an orchard 20 which was a pre-production model that never made it into production. This is a prototype machine, and I can't find any of these good ones in salvage yards. I can't just call up a buddy and rob some parts. This is pretty one of a kind, and I've got to fix it. So, stick around. Let's do it. Mr. Farmhand Man, what are you welding on? Can you tell me what you're welding on? Can you describe to me what filler metals you should be using? How you should be correctly repairing that? Is it a crack? Is it a break? Is it a bend? Did something move? Did something shift? You know, I can say farmers deal with a lot of stuff. Implements can be all over the board in terms of what they're made out of. You guys get some really high strength, high abrasion resistance chisels, getting those getting those things in the ground, those are really hard. And they're built to be hard. Frames, sometimes frames gotta flex, gotta move. Sometimes you're dealing with spring steel. And you all have to address that stuff differently. There's not a one, one solution fixes all. And that's gonna be step one in your correct repair so it doesn't break in the future. What am I welding on? Ask questions, find out. There was a really good video posted a while back by Weld.com where Mr. Moffitt and Mr. Tig had a conversation about identifying 
base metals and how to do that with shop tools, specifically a spark test. What is that going to help you do? It's going to help you gauge carbon content. I know this is a cast steel. You might be walking up to something you have no idea what it is. Identifying carbon in steel is important because it gauges how hard that steel is. The more carbon, the harder it gets, and the more finesse you're going to have to put into your repair because of that high carbon stuff. This is a relatively standard, nothing anything really special about it. How do I know that? Well, I'm going to identify the composition of this metal by a really simple spark test. I think you should spend a couple minutes, go back and watch that video. Tons of good information. Take it to heart. Use it. Apply it to your repairs. What am I going to use to repair this today? Well, I'm going to stick weld this. I'm going to stick weld that because I think that's realistic. If things are breaking in the field, if things are breaking out and about, you really got to worry about the environment you're welding in, and I think shielded metal arc welding is probably the most versatile process out there in terms of being able to combat all the different situations and different environments you need to weld in. It's easy. It's simple. It's effective. Don't overlook shielded metal arc welding. What am I going to use to repair this? Good old 7018. 7018 is a beautiful filler metal. It's a great welding rod. It's incredibly strong. And I'm going to take the time to prep this. And I'm going to fill this crack with 7018. And I'll tell you why. Man, there's a couple terms I think you need to familiarize yourself with. Ductility and hydrogen. Hydrogen's everywhere. It's in the air we breathe. It's in water, water vapor, moisture, dew points, moisture contents. Hydrogen makes welds crack. Hydrogen and brittleman is a real thing. 7018 is a good rod to help yourself combat that and fight back against hydrogen. If you want to repair to last, you got to start thinking about these fine details. If I don't want to burn a 6010 or a 6011, which is a real easy peasy, hot burning rod to get through rust and grime and dirt, is 6010 or 6011 always the bad, the best choice? Man, I don't, I don't think so. I think that this frame is going to see a lot of abuse. This frame is going to have to flex. And when I start talking about ductility and the material needing to flex and not fail, and I start talking about cellulose space electrodes and that hydrogen that they can trap, though they have a lot of positive good things and good applications, they do tend to typically allow more hydrogen into the well. Longevity is a big deal. I want this to last. 6010, 6011 might be a really common rod to go grab. It's going to use, it's going to have a lot of different purposes, and it's going to work well for a lot of different purposes. I'm just thinking about the long run, and I'm going to choose 7018. I have this in a shop. I understand that your implement or your piece of equipment might be broken in the field. If you got dirt you can't clean up, grime, junk, you might have to use a little bit of 6010 or 6011 to get through that stuff. Do your diligence. Take your time. Try to get that stuff out of there. Don't weld through junk. You don't have to. It makes your weld weak. In any case, I'm in a shop today. I'm going to grind this and I'm going to use 7018 because it has that low hydrogen capability. It's going to combat hydrogen and it's a really ductile welding rod. It's going to, it's going to work well for the application that I need it to work in. So here we are getting into this material prep, guys. I really want to take a minute here and take a flap wheel and really get all the grime, the dirt, the old paint, everything out of the area that I could potentially run over with a weld. I want to remove all that and get it completely out of the equation. That's, that's a good thing to always do when you're in the moment. If it's possible, if you're able, take the time to remove all the junk that your weld could possibly get contaminated with. I think this is the point in time where really 
you're going to make or break your repair process. Material prep, guys, it's super important. Material prep is absolutely necessary. I hate grinding. I know you probably hate grinding, but in any circumstance, it's it's necessary. And, and sometimes you just got to buck up and do it. What am I doing now? Well, you'll notice me physically start to use a hard-facing wheel now. I've got a stone on. I'm using just a quarter inch by four and a half stone. And I'm throwing that stone right into that crack. And right off the bat, you'll notice that spark test that I mentioned. I want to note the sparks that you might see me throwing off of this cast steel. You're going to notice those spark streamers and that spark burst is a little shorter and it's a little lighter with more of a burst on the end of it. That initially tells me that I'm working on a harder piece of material. What's really critical here is I get that grinder down into the root of that joint. I'm working that grinder into that crack. I'm rolling that grinder back and forth and I'm really starting to open that crack up. I have to put a bevel on either side of that break. I'm essentially turning this break into a big V groove. And I'm opening this groove up with enough groove angle and enough bevel that I can get my rod down into the bottom or the root of that joint. Getting that 7018 into the base and being able to weld that out from the back, the back out, is really what's going to put the strength back in here. Fit up is a big deal, guys. Ensuring that I'm welding this back together correctly so everything goes back together the way it should. What I'm doing here is I'm basically bolting down the front crank bracket, which is going to align the material. It's going to align the workpiece. It's going to align the base cast steel back to its original position so that I know everything is going to line up correctly when I'm done welding. That's a pretty big step. That's a pretty big deal. What I'm doing here is I'm checking my fit and I'm making sure that that V is ground all the way out. I'm making sure I don't have any super tight areas that I can't get my welding rod down into and I'm checking the overall condition of how everything is going to go back together. Super important step. Don't skip it. Hey guys, we got this little XMT machine, a little XMT 304 Miller. This is going to be pretty basic and straightforward. Run on direct current electrode positive. I'm setting my machine to stick. Um, 85, 88 amps. That's where I anticipate running this 7018. I'm using 332 second 7018. Direct current electrode positive, burning a little warm. Here we go. I'm at a really good spot here. I'm ready to start physically tacking this together. I've taken the time, I've prepped that material, I've put that nice deep wide V into that crack so I can get down into the root of the joint. I've bolted the front crank plate into place so I know everything is going to be aligned properly. I'm ready to start welding this together. What is a step that I don't want you to overlook before you start welding? And that's a generous preheat. Why is a preheat necessary? Well, if you guys back up a little bit to that spark test that I performed earlier when I started grinding on this, it told me that yes, this in fact does have some type of elevated carbon content in it, which is a big deal. We're using a 7018 low hydrogen electrode and we're dealing with a higher carbon piece of material. That preheat is gonna accomplish a couple things. Yes, it's going to help alleviate distortion. It's going to help with residual stresses during the welding process, but more importantly than not, it's going to help something called hydrogen cracking not take place. This material in certain places is upwards of an inch thick. I don't want to start welding on this immediately. I don't want to put a weld on a cold piece of metal. That rapid temperature decrease that base material rapidly pulling heat out of my weld is going to help it crack. Adding a preheat to the base metal will help reduce the chance of failure by cracking. What am I gonna preheat this to? Generically speaking, given I don't know the exact carbon content here, 
I would tell you guys if you're dealing with any kind of high strength steel or a higher carbon steel, a good two to 300 degrees is always a good place to start with a preheat before you start physically welding. The root pass is honestly, guys, a really critical weld. That root pass is kind of the backbone of this entire process as I fill out this V groove. You've got to ensure that you're getting that rod down into the bottom of that weld joint so you can put solid weld metal in the base of that joint. How am I doing that? I'm holding a really tight arc here, guys. I'm holding that tight arc and I'm walking across gaps where there's gaps. I'm washing that liquid puddle. I'm washing that fluid weld puddle from tow line to tow line and I'm making sure that I'm backfilling as I'm progressing along with this 7018. How am I doing that? Well, I'm holding a really tight arc and I'm making sure that I'm holding on the proper rod angle perpendicular to the workpiece. What am I doing for the rest of the route? and the rest of the weld joint? Well, I basically complete the root weld and I start to stack beads accordingly so I can fill out this V. I'm starting at the bottom and I'm working my way out and I'm laying stringer beads. I'm trying to stack these stringer beads into this V so I don't leave any voids or lacks of fusion. I wanna put as much metal in that groove as I possibly can and make that as sound as I possibly can. I think sticking with stringers is a good idea. I think when guys start to get those really wide weaves, you're just opening yourself up to more problems. Take a few stringers, take your time, weld your way out, and really pay attention to where you're stacking welds and that you're stacking welds and locking them together without any voids or lack of fusion. Take the time to bust your slag out of there. Take the time to wire wheel or wire brush your slag out of there so you're not leaving any slag pockets around. What's gonna help this repair is good solid weld metal and this is how we do it. What am I doing while I'm welding? Well, I'm doing a lot of the same things I'm always doing when I'm shielded metal arc welding. I'm, make, I'm making sure that I'm maintaining a proper rod angle I'm making sure that I'm maintaining a proper arc length and I make sure that I maintain proper body position throughout the transition of that weld so I can make that happen. This is really kind of the meat and potatoes of this whole process. Get in there, stack your beads, take your time, fill it out, you're welding from the root back and you're putting a cover pass on this that's over flush of your base metal. That's another critical step, is making sure that you're above flush. You wanna make sure that you're filling that joint all the way out. A little bit of reinforcement on the outside is not a bad thing here. All right, I'm wrapping this thing up, guys. I really appreciate you sticking with me and listening to what I got to say. I know some of you guys are out there trying to make repairs on the fly, I get it. I've been there. You've got to get what you can get done when you can do it so you can get back into production and back into service. I understand that. But do yourself a favor and try to apply some of this stuff. In this through break, if I wouldn't have ground that crack out and got metal into the root of the joint and filled that all the way out, I wouldn't have fixed the problem. I would have covered the problem up. If you're watching these, you care. If you care, you're you're giving yourself the benefit of effort, and I think people around you are going to notice that effort. Cliff Dennis, up here in Escanaba, Michigan, way up north at the Delta Schoolcraft Intermediate School District. I hope you guys can take some stuff away from this. I might not be out on those brand new, big, articulated eight-wheel drive machines, but hey, I'm going to play with the old stuff, and here's what I do. Have a good one. Like, follow, subscribe. Hitweld.com up. Give us suggestions. This whole episode was a suggestion, and I reached out and I wanted to do it. Give us more ideas. Let us know. Give us feedback. I 
really hope to hear from you guys soon.